while I'm waiting here, I'll introduce my friend Jim. We've been traveling around. We've known each other for quite a while, but never done this before, where we went on the road together. And uh, he focuses mainly on the uh, red portion of the red green axis, and I portion mostly on the green side. So between both of us, we cover quite a few of the bases. So that's what he's going to talk about today: is the overlap between the progressive leftists. And that ideology, which I talk about, undermining the sovereignty, and also how that blends in with what we've been seeing a lot lately is the controversy over immigration. So that's what he's going to be talking about today, some of the numbers and facts and figures. Somebody up there killed the center lights, maybe? You can keep the spotlight on me. <laughs> <laughs> I like the spotlight. I think that. Uh, uh, holy cow, it's a beautiful Sunday, it's a gorgeous Sunday, wonderful day to be out. What on earth are you all doing here? <coughs> oh my gosh, I think South Dakotans have a uh, masochistic streak. Come in here and hear all this horrible information about what's going on in our country. You all doing well? You all feeling good? You'll get over it. Um, so, the red green axis, refugees, immigration, I'm still waiting for that spotlight. I want everybody to see this gorgeous face. Um, red green axis, refugees, immigration, and the agenda to erase America. And I called it that because that's exactly what it is. I don't like to mince words. This is the green. Of course, green is a very big uh, color in Islamic tradition. And this is what I call the red. Of course, it's a lot of communists, the uh, Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, and this guy nobody's ever heard of, Sergei Nechayev. Any, anybody, let me see if there's hands. Anybody know who Sergei is? Anybody out there? One guy way in the back. You probably saw my, one of my other programs. Nobody knows who, I didn't know who Sergei was. But it's important to understand, it's important to look at this from the 30,000 feet and recognize that everything, not just some of the things, but everything that's going on in our country today is an asymmetrical military strategy of conquest. Everything that we see all the crazy agendas we see the hard left pushing that have nothing to do with Islam or seemingly communism, uh, transgender bathrooms, uh, open borders, all this stuff has its own adherents and its own advocates. And they all seem like, well, they do all seem like they come from one side of the political spectrum, but they don't all always seem like they're working together. And they may or may not be, but that is irrelevant because the fact is the entire program is dedicated to overthrowing our country. It's a military strategy. That's how you have to look at it. We are facing an asymmetrical military strategy of conquest. This is war. They mean it. And now we have the red-green axis up close and personal. Antifa has been discovered by the FBI to be working with ISIS, and that includes Antifa members going to Syria to learn bomb-making techniques. Charming idea. Uh, somebody's back there. Did I get a glass of water? Um, and here's some protesters. Oh, thank you. There it is. I was looking for that this morning. There's some protesters protesting uh, Trump's travel ban. This is just a week or so ago. And these are the Refuse Fascism folks. Well, if you go to the RefuseFascism.org website, you find that it's actually uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, they're all hardcore leftists. That's the point. Take the left, dismiss, every single thing they say. 
Dismiss it all. It is all irrelevant. It is all misdirection. It is all attack. It is all propaganda. Ignore it. We have to think about what's best for our society and ignore the white noise that they bring to us with increasingly overwhelming power. Oh, there they are. Wait a minute. What was I looking at? Oh, there. Yes, there they are. The Revolutionary Communist Party, the most radical communist party in the United States. Oh, but I didn't forget about Sergei. Sergei Nechaya was a 22-year-old anarchist in 1869, wrote something called the Revolutionary Catechism. Now read what he says there. He says that the uh, revolutionaries have to penetrate all the organizations and institutions of society. They have to make pretend they're one of us and get totally inside so they can corrupt it from within. And then, once they're there, they ceaselessly intensify the evils and miseries of people until at last they're driven to a revolt. Doesn't that sound like what's going on today? We're constantly getting poked in the eye with just outrage after outrage. Today, over 20 people were killed at a Baptist church near San Antonio, Texas. Just last week, there were eight people killed by a jihadi who ran them over in New York. A few weeks ago, there were 50 or so people killed in Las Vegas and hundreds injured. These things are accelerating. They are not lone wolves. These things are part of a coordinated effort to bring us to the point where we can't take it anymore. This is a standard communist tactic. You are brought to the point where you do one of two things. You either throw up your hands and say, I give up, I quit, I'm not going to fight anymore, I'm done. Do whatever you're going to do. You want power, take it. Or, we revolt and we fight. In either case, as far as they're concerned, it's a win. If we give up, they've got it. If we fight, then they can turn around and call us the haters, the domestic terrorists, the narrative that they've been trying to build ever since Obama took office. It actually came out in a Department of Homeland Security report where people like you and I are considered potential domestic terrorists. I mean, it even went so far as to identify people that have Ron Paul stickers as potential domestic terrorists. Can you imagine that? But there are a group of people out there that ceaselessly promote that agenda, that <coughs> protest on utterly false premises. The Ferguson riots were premised to a completely false premise. The riots in uh, Florida over Trayvon Martin, completely false premise. The riots over Freddie Gray in Baltimore, near where I live, completely false premise. They're just contrived for people to go crazy. And there's a group that specifically, deliberately agitates for those kinds of things. Not because there's any basis in reality for it, but because they're pushing us and pushing us and pushing us based on Sergei Nechaev's revolutionary catechism, which unlike us, most of them, the professional revolutionaries are very familiar with. Sergei Nechaev has a order of execution. The first people that are to die once the revolution takes over are people like you and me who are opposed to their agenda. The second group to die now is those who, through a series of monstrous acts, bring us to the point of revolt. So here I'm talking about what happened in Texas, what happened in Las Vegas, what happened in New York, what happens every day with these clowns who riot in the streets over nothing and break buildings and burn things down. Those people are <laughs> on the execution list, I hate to tell you, or I hate to tell them. Uh, personally, I don't mind it at all. 
Um, Sergei's revolutionary catechism has been used by every single communist revolution that ever came since. It was first formalized in uh, Felix Dzerzhinsky's Red Terror in 1917 after the Soviets took over, where they set out an order of execution and began eliminating entire classes of, of uh, the people in the country. And it's happened everywhere, every place since. They mean it. Now, this is what Khalid Sheikh Mohammed says. Look what he says. Jihadi my brothers would immigrate to the United States and wrap themselves in Americans' rights and laws. Doesn't that sound just like what the Chayab tells all his revolutionaries to do? And then, brothers relentlessly continue the attacks until the American people become so tired, frightened, and weary that they just give up. They want it to end. Straight out of the Chayab. Most of the Muslim Brotherhood top leaders most of the top leaders in Iran went to school at Moscow University. I bet you didn't know that. They learned these communist tactics. They learned these revolutionary tactics. And if you look, if Phil and I had more time, or if Phil had more time, we would discuss and perhaps juxtapose side by side the tactics that the uh, Islamists find justified in taking over and the communists. They're identical. All the tactics are identical. It's amazing, but there's a good reason for it. They work very well together because they're both totalitarian-minded. They both want to wrest control from this country, which is the jewel in the crown. So, these are current ISIS investigations. We know that they're in the United States. But we've got 79 convictions so far. It's just a snapshot up to the end of, I think, October, September, there, September. Um, of those, 300, at least 300 refugees have been implicated. You know, all the refugee uh, contractors in the refugee industry claim that they were used to say that no refugee has ever been involved in terrorism. They can't say that anymore because after Trump was elected, he opened up the records and General Sessions was able to find this, 300 refugees involved of those being investigated by the FBI. Now they say, well, no refugees ever killed anybody. It wasn't for lack of trying. We just saw three or four incidents last year where they went nuts with cars and knives. And they fortunately got killed before they could kill anyone. But they tried like heck and they injured a lot of people badly. So this is the left idea, and I alluded to it earlier. The issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. In other words, the issue doesn't matter. They don't care about gay rights. They don't care about gender rights. They don't care about refugee rights. They don't care about anything unless and except as they can use it as a vehicle to insinuate themselves into positions of power. That's what they did with the welfare program. That's what FDR did with the New Deal in the 30s. That's what they have done with every social justice issue ever since. They carve out a victim group, talk about how they're being oppressed and how they face injustice and aren't we mean American xenophobe, homophobe, Islamophobe, name your phobe people, preventing them from getting their due, and how could we possibly do that? How could we oppose that? They wrap themselves in the mantle of compassion and seize the moral higher ground so that we are playing on their rhetorical playing field. It's all tactics, right? It's all tactics. And along with it, they build the narrative that anyone opposed to them is a hater. And you heard some references earlier about the haters in, uh, where was it, in South Dakota, the woman who spoke earlier. Yeah, Rapid City. And we've also faced that here in Sioux Falls. We had one program shut down by an Islamic uh, woman who was a former care attorney who threatened the venue. They tried to do it to us to another, in another venue in Illinois and the people told them to buzz off. 
but it wasn't before they called the place where we were holding it, the organizer, and even the organizer's employer. These are things that they're really not allowed to do. They're interfering in private contractual arrangements. They're not allowed to do that. But they feel entitled and empowered, so they are doing it. And what they're trying to do is shut us down. Why? Because they're trying to build the narrative that we are bad people, that we are haters, and right now it takes the form of calling us names and vilifying us in the press, vilifying anybody who would uh, deign to hold a meeting like this and intimidate people, but they keep doing it, they keep doing it, building their cases, building their precedents to hopefully, eventually get that written into law, that what we are doing here constitutes illegal hate speech in which case we will be legally pre prevented from speaking under threat of criminal uh, prosecution. That's what they're going for. And like everything else I've said so far, this has a long history, a long pedigree that started with Lenin, who said we can and must write in language which sows hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. Note he doesn't say haters, bigots, uh, xenophobes, or racists. He says those who disagree with us. Same thing in the 1940s. They sent out uh, memos to the Communist Party of the World saying call us uh, anti-Semites, call us haters, call us Nazis. That's another big one still going on now, right? All the same people saying all the same things over and over and over again to try to discredit us in the public mind and at the same time shame America. They're trying to shame America so that their vision of America can be the one that comes to the fore. So all tactics, but it's very, very evil tactics. Because unlike us, who are very open-minded, we're the most generous people in the world, we are very open-minded, we are uh, we allow people to have avoid whatever kind of opinion they want. You, you, you can think whatever you want. I don't mind as long as you respect my right. But they don't feel the same way. They don't feel the same way at all. And the whole reason is because their goal is to take this country and obtain what they have always wanted, power and wealth. They're not trying to save the oppressed from the earth. They're not trying to liberate anybody. They're trying to seize our wealth, seize our power. And the only difference between that and the capitalists that built the railroads across the Great Plains, or the people that built our banking system, or anything else, is that they don't contribute anything. They take. They do not build, they do not produce, they do not edify, they don't build anything, they destroy. And that's all they can do. They are what I call entrepreneurial parasites. They're here to take, 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 take. And the only problem with their strategy is that if they're actually successful, in taking us down, the rest of the world is going with us. Because our nation, which produces about 25% of the world's goods and is 25% of the world's market, will take down the entire world with it. We will collapse. The world will collapse. So it's crazy idea after all, but it's very diabolical and it's very dangerous and we all have to recognize it for what it is. And you know, I hate talking about this half the time I'm like, do you really need this? Do you really believe it? You know, this sounds so crazy. It sounds like a conspiracy theory. 
But you know, I've been studying this for 30 years and they keep on proving me right in every single thing they do and every single thing they say. And the only difference between you and me is I've done the research to prove that this is what they do and this is what they say. It's the only thing that separates us and it may not even separate many of us. Some of you may have done research your own. You know all this already. Some of you may have intuited it. I intuited a lot of it before I found out any of it. It's really happening, and I don't even like to stand up here and tell you that, but it is. And we have to be prepared. So, after all that, and I've spent a half hour talking about other stuff, let's talk about refugee resettlement, which is what I came here to talk about. And uh, the refugee program, refugee resettlement program, is a little known but major part of this agenda. The Refugee Act of 1980 changed the entire program from one of voluntary uh, refugee resettlement where a private person would sponsor a refugee who had promised to come here, work, learn English, and support him or herself, to one where people come here by the tens of thousands and we set them up with every welfare benefit that you can think of, many of which we are not entitled to, and then grant upon grant upon grant so they can become established in business, so that they can get a job, and so that they can uh, establish a place to live. All of that for them exclusively. And it's an extremely expensive program. It was founded, or the idea, the Refugee Act of 1980 was written by Teddy Kennedy. Teddy Kennedy also wrote the 1965 Immigration and Naturalization Act. And he did that for the same reason. The idea was to bring, change the whole uh, immigration program from one where people came here to, vent, to, to produce and contribute and become part of our society to third world nations who came here to largely benefit from our society. Of course, some came and, and, and assimilated and became productive. but a much larger proportion to come here and take advantage of our welfare benefits. And, but the big important thing is, is they almost all become new Democrats. And that's what Kennedy was looking for in 1965, and again in 1980 when he expanded the base of captive, potential captive future voters. So the UN High Commissioner for Refugees selects the refugees out of UN camps, almost all of them, Overseas refugee processors ref, uh, select from that group and refers them to the State Department, which selects from that group and turns them to nine U.S. contractors called voluntary agencies or BOLAGs and 320 affiliates or subcontractors, which in South Dakota is Lutheran Social Services. And the affiliates do most of the work. The nine contractors are responsible for getting money from the State Department to a lesser extent, Health and Human Services, but the affiliates do most of the work. We resettle more than all other resettlement nations combined. We are the most generous nation in the world, as far as I'm concerned, we're way too generous. And we also, oh, okay, well here's a snapshot of um, primary refugee resettlement in South Dakota. Since 19, or since fiscal year 2002, a total of 6,062 people from these different countries, 35 countries. That's a snapshot. Now you'll notice that most of them are in Sioux Falls, some in Huron, the rest in other towns. We also have a number of unaccompanied alien children. That's the uh, illegal alien minors. And I only have from 202 since 2014 for those. But if you'll notice, South Dakota refugee resettlement, primary resettlement, has gone down since 2012. And that's because Lutheran Social Services, to a certain extent anyway, decided to take your concerns into account and reduce the number of uh, refugees they're bringing in annually. At least that's what they claim. And it may be that they're not just getting the numbers, but they claim that they're doing this because they are listening to all South Dakotans rather than just their fellow advocates. That would be a nice change 
uh, and very unique in the United States, if true. But in any case, primary resettlement of refugees in South Dakota has gone down over the last few years. Now, there's, been, there's plenty of secondary resettlement, I'm sure, and I don't know how, how many those are. And there are also numerous other groups which are not counted in this database, which is the only one that you can reliably check uh, any day to find out about refugees. And I will tell you about those in a second. This is what refugees are promised. And, you know, I want to be a refugee. Look at this. You get affordable housing, you get furniture, you know, you don't just show up and then go out and buy furniture and stuff like that. You show up, your house is furnished, there's food in the refrigerator, you're given cash in your pocket, you're given somebody a phone number for somebody to call when you need a ride somewhere, you're given rides to uh, work, to home, to uh, uh, job interviews, babysitting. Why do anything? You know, you get all these foolish Americans that just carry you around everywhere buy stuff for you, it's great. Doesn't happen for Americans. If there's a two year in some cities, there's months long, years long, waits for public housing. If you're a refugee, you get right in. If you're a crippled veteran, you wait. How do you like that? In uh, Port, Port, uh, Portland, Maine, the governor of Maine told me that um, Autistic men who spent their lives with their families are now out in the street because, you know, they, the families took care of them when their families died. They needed a place to, to go, find some uh, public housing to live in. The public housing is all taken by refugees, so the homeless population in Portland, Maine is swelling with autistic men. Refugees, despite all the benefits they get, you use welfare at rates vastly higher than Americans and even all other immigrant groups. And you can see that goes all the way back to 1980 when they first started coming here. And this is the 2015 rate for people who have been here from 2015 all the way back to 1980. And compare that with U.S. born rates. So, I started with that because I wanted to show you this. We get refugees, and this is the refugee program over here. And if you note, uh, Trump reduced it to the cap to 45,000 people in fiscal year 2018. Uh, that was actually a big win because the whole refugee industry battled for 70,000, but they didn't get it. But what this doesn't show is that this isn't the refugee program. This is the refugee program. Oh, oh no. Oh no, it's not working. Uh oh. Sorry folks. Technology wrecked me. They're under hiding under this yellow screen, which is supposed to disappear, but it's not working. Uh, are Special immigrant visas, about 10 to 15,000 a year. Uh, human Haitian entrance uh, in 2016 was 73,000. Uh, asylum seekers, about 25,000 a year. Uh, <coughs> trafficking victims, another about 1,000. And unaccompanied alien children, anywhere from 20 to 50,000 a year. In 2016, the total was 275,000 people. Those are the people who get to benefit from the refugee program. And so, this is the most powerful slide I have, and figures. I come to Aberdeen, South Dakota, and it wouldn't work. It's your fault. So, um, and then over here on the right-hand side, I did a calculation based on uh, Based on this, uh, just for these years, 2009 to 2018, and if you looked, the cost for the whole cohort of all these groups uh, from 2000 in 2018 would be 17, uh, uh, sorry, 14 billion dollars. So if you go back to 1980, just do the math. 
we're talking somewhere between 50 and 100 billion dollars a year to pay for the welfare for these people. And I have not done that calculation yet, but I intend to. So, and then we have other overlooked groups like asylum families, 10 to 15,000 a year. Families for the unaccompanied alien children, because actually they weren't unaccompanied, you know, they came over with a lot of families, maybe not their own. Temporary protected status, about 325,000 people, although we just found out that the State Department has announced that 60,000 of them are eligible to go home and they're going to be sent home, and most of the rest of the others are going to be decided about around the beginning of next year. Now, this is really significant because of what, it, what it means is that the Trump administration is the first administration to ever actually enforce the temporary protected status law. It started in 1990 to accommodate the approximately, well, a couple hundred thousand of the approximately one million Salvadorans, one-fifth of their total population, that came to the United States during the Salvadoran Civil War in the 1980s. And so they created in 1990, and so if you're here because of war, because of uh, some natural disaster like a hurricane or an earthquake, you could stay here until the coast was clear and then you could go home. So you got an 18-month, uh, basically temporary legal residence here. But then after 18 months, you could renew. And then you could renew again, and then again, and then again. So, of that 325,000, 200,000 are still Salvadorans. And the other ones are people from Nicaragua and uh, uh, Honduras who came here in the late 90s following uh, 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 an earthquake, still here. People from Syria since 2012, still here. Many other countries. They just keep on renewing, renewing, renewing. Well, the Trump administration for the first time said, okay, Guess what? We're not renewing anymore. <laughs> you're, you're safe to go home. You know, the, the, the earthquake in Nicaragua ended around 1999. They've since rebuilt, at least I hope. You're free to go home there. Same thing with Haiti. And so he's sending them back. That's great news. It's great news. No president up till now has actually enforced the law. It's turned into a endless, endless, basically a, a, a long-term amnesty program. Many of these people are now married to Americans. You have American kids who are still going home. Diversity visa, that's another one he is proposing to uh, end. And he reiterated that proposal right after our friend in New York mowed over eight people. Guess why? Because he was a beneficiary of the diversity visa program. It's a lottery where millions of people put their names in every year. The State Department fix, picks 50,000 out of the hat. And you can just come here as people all over the world. You know, diversity is our strength, they say. Diversity is our strength. No, actually diversity the way they conceive it is a prescription for chaos and anarchy. That's what it is. Placing hundreds of groups with totally different backgrounds, traditions, cultures, languages, throwing them all together, and with some, with many only a rudimentary understanding of the rule of law, many who have lived under oppressive nations as uh, governments, and they only, that's all they know, is not a prescription for strength. It is a prescription for chaos. And we saw it last week in New York. I'm facing just one example of many. In Rochester, New York, resettlement contractors in their infinite wisdom resettled Bhutanese families right smack dab in the heart of the ghetto section of Rochester. Every single family has at least one member who's been mugged and they're ready to take up arms against the inner city uh, residents. This is the kind of stuff that is not our strength. And it's natural. People come, you know, it's difficult enough to overcome language barriers 
to overcome language, culture, and while you're trying to earn a living and raise a family and all this stuff, it's not a prescription for strength. It's a prescription for lunacy. But the left really doesn't lie when they say that because for them, it is their strength. And why is that? Well, because <laughs> everything else. They want chaos. They are trying to create chaos. They are trying to turn our nation into a society of anarchy. And they are trying to dilute our culture and our populations to the point of political irrelevance. That's one of their ways of subverting our country. It's very devious, very underhanded. That's what they're doing in the meantime, wrapping themselves in the mantle of compassion and saying, how could you possibly think diversity is not our strength? You, bigot, you racist, right? Keeps us on the defensive while they push forward. Now the Council on American Islamic Relations, which uh, Phil talked about before, uh, Muslim Brotherhood member, unindicted co-conspirator of the Holy Land Foundation trial, and PR arm of the terrorist group Hamas is one is at the forefront and every time there's a terrorist attack like the one in New York they run an interference for the terrorists oh it had nothing to do with Islam uh, it, 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 nothing, it was a lone wolf he was a lunatic it, there's nothing to do with and they keep saying that and they keep saying that but what they're really doing is keeping us on the defensive keeping us confused so that they can continue to bring in as many of their people as they can, as quickly as they can, before we finally catch on and it's too late. Because once they establish a, a certain proportion of the population in any location, then they start pushing their hardcore Sharia compliant agenda. And I want to tell you something. I don't think most of the Muslims that come here are all about that. They are being used as much as we are. They are being used to provoke us. But what would you do if you came to a country and all your leaders were creating this division? They were calling us racists and bigots and Islamophobes, and some of us were actually kind of getting a little pissed off because we're paying for it. We're seeing the damage that's being caused in our schools, in our cities, in everything we do, and we're paying for it through tax dollars. We have a right to question it. But they see that, and they hear the leaders saying, well, we're nothing but a bunch of Islamophobes. It puts, it creates division. That's what they want to do, create division. Why? It's the oldest tactic, military tactic in the book, divide and conquer. And unfortunately, they have a huge mass of people they can use as tactics. So here he is, our diversity lottery winner. Our settlement budget has been reduced 28%. If you could have seen that panel before, you would have seen it's justified by the numbers going down because the Trump administration is enforcing the law. They're enforcing border laws, they're, they're tightening up the asylum program. All of the refugee programs are fraught with vast fraud. And all you need to do is know that, for example, Somali rep, quote unquote refugees now go home for month long vacations in Somalia. You, if, if you have a credible fear of going home based on uh, uh, being uh, persecuted for your beliefs, your religion, your uh, sex, or your race, or whatever, which is the definition of refugee, then you're not going to want to be going home for one month long vacations to visit your relatives. But that's what they do. They're not refugees, most of them. And so they're tightening that up, so there's going to be a lot less of it. So he's reduced it 28% as he promised. That's another promise he's made that you probably don't know about. These things are going on behind the scenes. So while we're all being demoralized by the news, and by the things that are happening around us, quietly, they're actually trying to do something. So you should take some 
comfort in that. Uh, this is what I just want to talk about before overseas humanitarian assistance, eight billion in fiscal year 2017. This is where the real answer is, because most of those people don't want to come here. They want to go back home. So what should our job be? Our job should be to make it comfortable for them, to be in the refugee camps where they are safe, and then work, get, get our State Department to do its job for a change, and actually solve an international issue. You know, we have a lot of power as the United States. We don't use it. We just say, oh, okay, I'll just bring them all over here. But we are the most generous in overseas humanitarian assistance, and that includes to the Syrian crisis, 6.5 billion since 2012, vastly more than anybody else, vastly. The next highest is Britain, and then the next highest you have to add a number of the Gulf states to even come close to Britain. So, but this is the answer. It's 12 times more expensive to resell a refugee to the United States than it is to help one over there. If you can help 12 people over there for every one here, and they don't want to come over here in the first place, why on earth are we bringing them here? Because the resettlement community get, makes big money to do that. That's why. That's why. There's a massive political industry infrastructure that promotes refugee resettlement. And here are the Volags. This is what they have made just in 2016. Bishops, Catholic bishops made 104 million in 2016. LIRS, that's the parent organization for LSS, made 60 million in 2016. Um, that's what it looks like. The Illegal Alien Youth Program is even bigger. Baptist Child and Family Services, Health and Human Services Program, 200 million in 2016. It's close to 300 million in 2014. A lot of money. And the leaders get between two, 200 and 500,000 a year for basically administering a, 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 a grant, filling out a form, justifying the numbers and sending it in. I want that job. I can do it in my sleep. They can too. And they probably do. Ford Foundation, all the foundations here support the Open Borders agenda. All people by radical leftists, as are these Volags, even though some of them are nominally religious, they are all staffed by radical leftists and they cannot proselytize. So if any of them tell you that they're here to do the Great Commission and you're all a bunch of uh, bigots or, or chintzy or uh, you know, uh, Islamophobes because you're questioning their program, their real reason is to make money. They, they cannot proselytize, they lose their uh, contracts. And it's my favorite one. I didn't get a chance to change this to South Dakota, even though I have the data. But South Dakota is about $12.70 an hour for about $27,000 a year for doing nothing. If you're unemployed, that's what you can get if you take all the benefits that are uh, available to you. So, they say, well, we hire a refugee because we can't get people to work for less than between $12 and $15 an hour, and we only want to pay eight to 10. So the refugees, you know, it's more money than they've ever seen. So, we hire a refugee at 725 an hour, that's 15,000 a year. But a family with two kids, and one parent can get 17,000 in welfare benefits. So they're actually going to make about 30 grand a year. So how are we getting lower cost labor? How are we getting cheaper labor? Labor. We're not. All we're doing is we're subsidizing the labor, the wages that business pays. That's what we're really doing. And it's under the radar. We don't see it because it's welfare, right? It's just in the welfare program. But it's exactly what we're doing. And the Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, all these groups trip over themselves to bring in refugees and advocate that. And that's why so many Republicans favor it, because they're responding to their major donors, as opposed to responding to the people that they were elected to represent. And that's the problem. But what are we doing? We are just subsidizing 
those donors. That's what we're doing. What's the real answer? Is the real answer to flood our nation with uh, populations from all over the world? No. The real answer is to reform welfare. And we tried it in 1996, but when Obama was elected, he, he used his phone and his pen to change all the regulations and put them back where they were before. Illegally, but that never stopped him before or since. Um, but that's what we need to do. We need to reform welfare. We need to make welfare only available to the truly needy, not to anybody that just comes along. And it has to be temporary. We have to make it as something. The, the left went, went to the mats to turn welfare into uh, what they wanted was a standard national income. And they tried to get that done in, 19, in the late 60s through the Great Society, but they couldn't establish it. So instead, they went through the back door, increasing all the different welfare benefits and adding new ones here and there and here and there until it came up to essentially the same thing through welfare benefits. If you live in Chicago, if you're a young woman in Chicago and you have two kids and you're earning 8 25 an hour, you can earn $60,000 equivalent in welfare benefits. So your, your actual take home, if you count your benefits as cash or, you know, cash equivalent, equivalent to about $80,000. How, will she ever go any further than 825 an hour? Will she ever bring herself out of poverty? No, she'll live like a queen in poverty. We need to fix that. That's what we need to fix. You don't need to bring in boards of people from all over the world as a family because at the same time that we're uh, subsidizing low wage or industry, we are increasing our long-term unemployed Americans and entrenching an ever higher level of unemployment. These are the facts. And, you know, we're called bigots and racists for bringing these facts to you. I want to slap the next person that tries to call me that. Nobody has tried to call me that to my face yet. They better not. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the time they do. Uh, health issues, tuberculosis, HIV, Language barriers, translation costs, English language learner costs. Uh, the Muslims are being told to integrate, not assimilate. That's critical. Integrate, not assimilate. And you know, the name of my book is um, The Agenda to Erase America. It was very clever. Lutheran Social Services of Michigan recently came out with a study on the great economic benefits of uh, of uh, refugees, and basically their entire report talked about how much money the federal government was going to be bringing in to the area. And, you know, they just don't get the fact that the federal government didn't give them that money. The taxpayers gave them that money. So when taxpayer money comes into Michigan, it means it's been taken out from somewhere else. So it's a zero-sum game. They don't get that. They only talk about, oh, it's so wonderful for Michigan, and everybody else has to pay for it. But they said that, in that, they said that they focus on integration, not assimilation, because there are bad people out here trying to claim that we are trying to erase their culture. <laughs> How do you like that? Sort of a backhanded compliment. They always accuse us of doing what they're doing. That's the point. Crime and terrorism, all happens. And here's a snapshot of the Muslim Brotherhood in America. I did this in 2012 when Obama was still in office. But you can see how all these groups interact. Yes, KGB had a big role in producing Al-Qaeda and supporting the Muslim Brotherhood and all the terrorist groups that came out of that, Hamas, the Palestine Liberation as an organization was a creation of the KGB. And there's a whole, uh, well, it'll take hours to go through this, but it's an interesting snapshot that should just sort of give you the chills. And here's the depth of the penetration. This guy, Al Abdurrahman Al Alamudi, was counselor to Billy Boy and George, and then he got caught 
in a conspiracy to try to assassinate the Saudi king. Whoops. So now he's doing 23 years in prison. Not, not the innocent, grandfatherly type he looks like he might be. He selected all the Muslim chaplains for the military. Nidal Hassan, ring a bell. And the Islamic Society of North America selects Muslim chaplains for all federal and many state prisons. It gives you an idea why so many people are coming out of prison as radical as Muslims. That's why. All Muslim Brotherhood fronts. And this is Michael McCall, head of the House Homeland Security Committee, telling these two uh, guys from the Muslim Brotherhood, from the uh, CARE, that they are moderate Muslims. He's nuts. And he also wanted to be Department of Homeland Security Secretary. Uh, some people in Washington, D.C. made sure that didn't happen. That's another little bit of good news behind the scenes you don't know about. So, the Refugee Resettlement Program is a crisis strategy like all the other ones. It's an unconstitutional, unfunded mandate because it forces state and local governments to pay for things that they didn't ask for. It's ever challenged, and you get a you get a court that's not been stacked with Obama uh, appointees, it'll be thrown out. Dilutes American culture, which is erasing American culture. It sucks up welfare resources, creates division, crime, racial, ethnic tension, stress, unemployment for Americans. However, creates a lot of employment opportunities for refugees. It does create opportunities for terrorism, even if the terrorists aren't refugees, because they can hide. You know, Mao had a, had a uh, Mao Zedong had a had a um, metaphor that terrorists could swim like fish among the people and hide among the people, and that's what they can do in these Muslim enclaves. They can swim like fish and not be seen, and plan and hatch their uh, terrorist ideas. It definitely fosters crony capitalism and corruption in a big way. And you know that's not only at the national level, it's also at the state level in a big way, and the local level, and I know you guys have all seen it. Um, we have been sort of asleep at the switch, unfortunately. And in fact, local politics is some of the most corrupt politics there is. Why? Because nobody pays attention to it. You know, if you have a local election, how many people show up to vote for the mayor and for the city council? A couple hundred maybe, a thousand, out of, you know, however big the population is? It's a teeny amount. And there's two things about that. One, it tells you how apathetic we become, but it also tells you how easily it could be taken back. Because all you need is organization and enough people to oppose the expected turnout and get your person or people elected. And that's what we need to do. However, we can forget about all these bad things because after all, this is what we really want. We want to cultivate a bunch of new Democrats and that's what we get with the refugee program. In five years, they can apply for citizenship and get to vote. And uh, as we've seen in California and elsewhere, Illegal aliens are already voting, and in many cases, uh, there is so much vote fraud. Uh, that's another ag uh, agenda that I've done extensive research on, and uh, it, it, it's something that I'm sorry to say the left. And for those of you who are Democrats, I, I apologize if I offend you, but the the party, the top members of the party, are very corrupt, and they are they depend on vote fraud for, I would say, anywhere between 3 to 5 percent of their vote. And so in close elections, vote fraud will win it. It won it in Minnesota with the election of uh, Al Franken, who was never funny, even when he was a comedian. <laughs> so what can we do? We can pray. And he's a terrible senator. We can pray. We have to pray. This is the this is zero hour, folks. It's very late. The hour is very late, and we've been behind the eight ball. We really need to step up 
And we need the supernatural assistance of our God who brought us this great country. Amen. But he also gave us free will. He said, yeah, you can lose it if you want. You know, you don't have to pay any attention to me. Go ahead. Do as you want. Do what you think is best. See how it works out for you. We have to pray. We have to recognize our sovereign, our higher power, our God, the man who brought us here, brought this wonderful country to us, and we have to beg for his assistance because we need it now more than ever. We need to elect strong, committed leaders like the gentleman who spoke earlier. They're very rare, you know. People are actually willing to stand up here by our side. They're very rare. That gentleman is an inspiration to me. Restore our sovereignty. I still say we have to restore our sovereignty. That's what's going to save us. And there are a bunch of specific things we can do that I would like to perhaps talk with you later. Not now, because it will take too much time, and I'm sure I've already taken way too much time. So much time that you're not even going to get to enjoy any of that nice, sunny South Dakota day. <laughs> it's stuck in you, and that's all afternoon. You must be crazy. All right. So thank you all very much. This is uh, my website, crisisnow.net. And Corcoran has Refugee Resettlement Watch blog. She is the undisputed expert on that program. And the Center for Security Policy brings in all kinds of very good stuff with experts who have been around for decades. Thank you all very much.